Hello, everybody. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the latest episode of the Transatlantic Rebels podcast. My name is Jessel and my co-host is Rochard. This week, we're going to be talking about a trio of incredible films, courtesy of the writer and director, Taylor Sheridan. We have Wind River, we have Hell or High Water, and Sicario. So stay tuned, this is going to be an interesting So this week on the Transatlantic Rebels podcast, we are going to be talking about, uh, well, primarily the work of Taylor Sheridan, but mostly in reference to a film called Wind River, which was released in 2017. And uh, I think it was nominated as one of the best uh, Oscar films this year, actually, in in early 2018. And um, also a couple of his other films from the previous year. So there's Hell or High Water and Sicario. So he's basically knocked out like a film a year, um, primarily as the writer, but in Wind River, he directs it himself as well. I think it's his directorial debut. And uh, it's an interesting trio of films. They're kind of neo-Western films, and um, there there tends to be a kind of murder, mystery, some shock, some really shocking violence as well, actually, frequently. Um, But also there are interwoven various kind of backstories and bits of America that you don't usually see or bits of somewhere else that you don't usually see. So, Rashad, what made you choose, well, primarily Wind River, but the other ones too? I mean, a lot of it is basically like, um, like he talks, he, he talks about the three movies called like a kind of like a frontier trilogy in a sense, where it is kind of like that, like that, like the modern Western kind of feel in a sense where it's, it's um, like how... Like back in the like back in the day, where they used to go to the old west, try to find something new, or try to find some kind of new way of life, but everywhere you turn around, you is nothing but disappointment in a sense. It's like going out for that hope, and then you find out that there's no hope. There. There's a line that um that uh, ben- uh Benito del Toro's character says in uh, Sicario, where he says to um Emily Bunt's character, he says um this is the land of wolves, and uh, you're not a wolf, so you have to leave. I'm, I'm paraphrasing that line, but he says it better than what I'm saying it right there. But in a sense, it feels like. Like within the three movies, especially when River is like these characters are trapped in this world where it's like there's, he said he said the big thing with the three movies is like the, the rule of law doesn't work for certain people anymore. And what Benicio de Toro says to uh, Emily Blunt is like in the sense where it's like um, this is not a place for you anymore. You need to find a place where there is that stuff, but down here it is not it doesn't exist anymore. And I thought that was kind of like more relative to what's going on in America in a sense, with the fact of like the delusion of the American dream is kind of like. It's not really there anymore, in a sense, for a lot of people. And he made the argument where it's, with, with three movies where Wind River deals with like um, the Native Americans, and uh, Hell of High Water deals with um, the quote unquote like it's not like not MAGA because it was made before that stuff, but it's like like those Midwestern people, and then um, with the drug trade and the bo- the border in America, it kind of deals with the, the failure of law in all three of those different areas. And I think on a and it, it's more and it's more I think it's more. Um, relatable today because of the fact there's so much violence going on in America. It's like, I was thinking about the other day where I was talking about how even when the European settlers came over to our land, in a sense, that's where like the true violence start, and it's been ingrained in our DNA ever since then. And I think that those Taylor Sheldon movies, when the violence you're talking about, is kind of relative because it's like, it's it's kind of a tragedy because the stuff can be avoided, but it always seems to go to the violence for reasons that are beyond understanding and logic in a sense so i think a lot of those things where it's like that 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 loss of law that loss of hope and the unnecessary violence i think all those three ideals are relative to what's going on in america today and that's why i kind of thought it'd be good to do a podcast on this stuff so we're kind of in the spoiler free section right now um why don't we continue that and then then we'll kind of cut off and start getting into actual spoilers about about the various films themselves so um i mean why don't you take wind river first um, that one was the, I think, I didn't see Hell High Water in the theaters. I saw Sicario in a movie theater. 
and I saw Hello High Water by myself because nobody didn't want to go see it because they saw like the the poster and all stuff like that. And it was like, what the hell is this? Blah blah blah, yada yada yada. So because I liked the other two movies, I went to go see this one. And I know the the, the the original joke was, oh, it's Hawkeye and Scarlet Witch in the movie together again. They're doing their thing. And it's like, it's almost like a joke where it's like he's showing her the ropes again, in a sense, the way that uh, Jeremy Renner and I looked both her in there. But I'm getting back to the actual movie. Um, I just remember watching it, and I, and here's the thing, and here's the thing I feel about this guy. I think he's only going to get better. I think these movies are like strong movies, but I think um, he still, he still finds his, like as far as a writer, like he made a point where he's like, his movies aren't about plot. He likes to keep his plot simple. It's more along. It's more about how the characters react to a situation. Like you'll set up a situation, and then have the character have some kind of past connection to what's going on with that situation. And it's always a person in these movies where it's kind of like, like it's like almost like the ignorant American that comes into an area. And in this movie, it's Elizabeth Olsen, whereas Jeremy Renner is kind of the guy that's been along with the Native Americans the whole time, and he lost his child. And the way the plot works is not getting the spoilers. It's pretty much that he lost a child. And he comes across a Native American who lost his child. And he gets paired up with an FBI agent, which is with Olsen. And she's kind of like a, not like a rookie, but she's not really experienced in that area because she came from Las Vegas. And it's like the only help that they could, that's the only help that the FBI sent them. And as you, as you watch the movie, you see them talking about how it's kind of like hitting that in a movie, like how l- the law in America doesn't really support the Native Americans like they should. And they kind of leave them in a sense of fend for themselves. So, I mean, that's the general gist of the movie with the plot. Yeah, then I'll take uh, Hell or High Water. So that was the, released the year before. So Taylor Sheridan wrote it, but it was directed by David McKenzie. Um, it follows a couple of brothers. So you've got Chris Pine as one of the brothers. And he's kind of, I, I hesitate to say uglied up, but he's clearly kind of like like beaten up a bit, basically. He's not the kind of usual... Yeah, pretty boy. Yeah, he's not the usual pretty boy. He's got a beard and he's kind of a bit more rough around the edges and stuff, which I, I guess is probably makeup they had to make him look worse with because I'm sure naturally he's probably too good looking. Um, but anyway, they start like, you know, we're in the spoiler free, but they immediately start setting out uh, on, a, on a spree of bank robberies, like in the first, you know, three minutes of the film. Um and then it turns out that the, there's there's various kind of motivations behind that. And then you've got the law who are trying to, you know, get them. I, I think one of the things Taylor Sheridan said is a common thread throughout these three films is it's, um, I think this is his quote, individuals trying to maintain rule of law in impossible circumstances. And that's clear throughout three of these films. Um, I think it's least clear in this film, perhaps in Hello High Water. This is more about really the story of the brothers. Um and less so, I mean, I mean, it's definitely kind of, there's a fair bit about the actual police who are, the, specifically the two policemen who are trying to chase them. But it's not really about their kind of circumstance in impossible circumstances as much as the other two films are, I think, which are much more obvious. Um, this is more about the kind of backstory of the, the two brothers, what they're getting up to, why they're doing it. Um, and, and I think it, it's kind of, it kind of makes love to, that area of America, which is forgotten. You know, I, I think sometimes in this kind of Twitter sphere, you forget that white people are suffering in America too. Even if they did vote for Trump or if they didn't, you know, prior to that, you're talk- I think this is set in uh, 2010 and, um, and the banking crisis has just happened. Lots of people have lost their homes, their livelihood, all these kind of things. The banks were acting really callously and, and there was a knock on effect and, this film deals with that specifically. Um, but there is a lot of violence in it. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of poetic license as well, but it, it's definitely worth your time. It's probably my least favorite of the trilogy, maybe in some ways. And in other ways, it's probably my favorite. I don't know. It's kind of a bit more lighthearted than the others in certain respects, I'd say as well. Um, okay. And then if you take Sicario. Okay. And Sicario is basically, um, it starts Emily Blunt. And it stars Benicio Del Toro and Josh Brolin. And basically, um, um, Emily Brunt is a police officer who gets involved with this, um, with, uh, with the drug trade in Mexico. And you have Benicio Del Toro, who's like a mystery guy that's along for the ride with Josh Brolin, which is a government agent. And for certain reasons, they need Emily Blunt to, as a police officer, to kind of get to areas that he normally couldn't have to kind of deal with the situation in Mexico. 
And um, there's a connection that Del Toro has to the drug trade that is... <sighs> Before we get into spoil, I can't get into spoilers with that one because it's a spoiler aspect. But he has a personal vendetta to deal with when it comes to the drug trade. And you kind of show how the U.S. government kind of like uses people to their advantage, not just only Emily Blunt, but also Del Toro's tragedies to kind of go into the situation and try to make things quote unquote right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, I appreciate that. It's difficult to sort of talk about Sicario with the, without ruining things. Um, I guess the common thread, like I said, was, was, you know, this kind of rule of law, which is just very difficult to enforce in, in certain circumstances. But also I think Sheridan takes in each one of these films a different area. Like here, I think he's talking about in like in, in Juarez, Mexico. And back then there was, I know they got pissed off about it, but there was a huge problem prior to when they started to clean it up. And then in Hell or High Water, I don't, where, where exactly is that set? In West Texas, right. So in Texas, you know, around that time, around 2010, you've got the banking crisis, which was affecting huge areas of the country, and especially the ones where, you know, people had ranches and this and that. and, and well, or, or at least he decides to hone in on that particular area because people kind of forget about these things. And then you've got Wind River, which was set in Wyoming, and that, wow. I mean, if you talk about the environment there, you have sweeping shots. It's freezing cold. And, um, I mean, I'll get, I'll get into why I kind of connected with that film, particularly after the spoilers, but it, he takes, he, it's, I think it's quite clever. He kind of takes a various, a specific area rather and, um, and then kind of expands upon layers and layers of detail. So you can kind of, you can view this on a superficial level and then the more and more you think about it you can kind of unravel various threads and get more and more from it i think that's the clever thing about it I, in each one i don't think the the plot is particularly complex or anything like that i think he just likes to put in these kind of landmines that you step on every now and then and it shocks you or it takes you in a certain a certain emotional way um it's very kind of manipulative screenwriting but i say that in a complimentary way i guess um although it might not be to everyone's taste, but I think people seem to have responded pretty well to these three films, especially Sicario. Let me ask you a question before okay. you continue. Do you think it's more? You think it's more of like him being like an edit, like editorial in a sense, editorial directing in a sense? Yeah, perhaps. The, the, I well, okay. You talk about directing because then he only directed Wind River. I mean, if you talk about the writing and then that kind of like, yeah, I mean that editorial style. I think it's very conscious and I know he said that I think he knocked these out all in six months or something like that, like in the same session and he was most protective of wind river. Um, but I don't know. Let me just say this. Uh, this isn't a spoiler. So we'll get into the spoiler free section afterwards, but with two of these films, I watched the first 45 minutes and then really struggled and switched off and then came back to them and watched them again and then liked them a lot more the second time. It was really strange. Interesting. Yeah, really interesting. Well, so the first one was Sicario. And actually, Sicario, I remember, I actually fell asleep, to be perfectly honest. I think I'd watched the first 45 minutes, and then I fell asleep, and then I was like, I just wasn't really feeling it. And then it took me a year to come back to it and then watch it, and I was like, damn, actually, this was worth my time. Um Hello High Water I watched that was the last one I watched but I watched that all the way through Wind River I watched the first 45 minutes of that and uh, I just wasn't feeling it to be honest like not I, I didn't think this is a shit film but I just my my attention was just not committed to it I think I started just looking at my phone and stuff like that and I, even though I knew we were doing the podcast on this but I just wasn't connecting to it and then I just stopped I was like okay look, just chill and then I left it about five days and then we had this huge well okay we didn't have a huge blizzard in London it was basically like half an inch of snow but that shuts down the whole country in the uk because we're useless at this kind of stuff but anyway so uh, like no one could go to work because our country's just crap at these things <laughs> so i stayed at home and i watched wind river and then suddenly because you're watching this kind of really snowy like freezing wyoming and then i've got i've got like an inch of snow in the garden then i connected with it more and i didn't look at my phone once i didn't look at my laptop once i just watched the film and was actually mesmerized by it so i uh, I think maybe his style is something that you kind of have to get over first if you kind of like more esoteric work or more nuanced work. I think this kind of bangs you over the head in certain ways, but then once you kind of let it unfurl, it is 
nicely layered. So I think it's quite, it's really difficult to describe Sheridan's work. And maybe that's why people have connected with it, and especially critics, because it does challenge you, even if it feels like it's not challenging you at all. It's kind of strange. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. It's like, it's, it, it plays, it plays it both ways. He keeps it simple, but then it's kind of like, it's more meta, meta. I can never say this word right. And I'm, 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 I'm an ex actor. Meditative. It's like one of those things where it's like, he, he said in the interview, he was like, He's not like you said. The point, the, the the plots are paper thin. If you talk about his plot, you can really spin his plot in like a less than a minute. You can you can really say <laughs> the premise is what it is and let it go there. But he's not interested in the plot as so much as how the people react. Like I said earlier before, I think that's what he's more interested in: how the people react to the situation rather than the situation itself. Because I remember he, I was watching something where he was talking about him and other directors, and he says he hates exposition. Like he, like as an actor, he used to hate exposition. He hates explaining stuff to you. He just wants to let the situation be there and then let it play and then see what happens. And I think what I and I think the thing with his movies, at least with the director with him, I think on purpose he wants it to be a little bit slower. So I can, so when you said that you turned off in forty five minutes, like when you watch, I could, my friends watch like, one of my friends watched Sicario, and he's like, why the hell have we got all these long ass <laughs> shots of it, it is it is all three of them. Like sometimes you'll see in, in um in um um in Sicario, it's like it's like it's like a, it's like a, it's like an overhead shot. And it's like an overhead shot for like maybe three or four minutes. Like, what the hell's going on here? And then in um, Hello High Water, sometimes you're just driving across the road, just driving, it's curving. And then in Wind River, it's the same thing. It's kind of like you're just crossing a, a, a patch of stuff or whatever like that. It kind of goes for a little bit. I mean, Sicario is like the biggest one that does that. But it's a little bit less than the other two. But I think because of the way that modern editing works, unless you're always watching these type of movies and you come back to them, you'll, you'll, you'll get thrown off by it. Because the editing is a lot more slower than this. Mostly, most of the modern era kind of like editing, except for maybe like stuff like like the occasional Blade Runner or something like that. Like they usually just get to the, it's always get to the point, always get to the point in a sense. So when you when you go from the get to the point kind of editing of Hollywood movies to like kind of like these kind of movies, and I can understand why people will kind of like certain people get turned off by it. But I also understand like if you're in the you have to be in the right mood for these movies too at the same time. Yeah, also, yeah. Which I think is what you're trying to get at. And the other thing is, is that I watched them at home and I think Sicario, I probably would have been, ben I think it would have helped me a lot if I'd watched it in the cinema, because there's two things. First of all, you're trapped in the cinema and you just can't get out and you can't get around, you can't get on your phone and stop being a dick unless you're a complete dick. And you've paid money for it. So you feel committed. You're like, okay, I'm going to see this through no matter what. But also those shots you were talking about, I actually really liked those shots. That was one of the things I did like about it in that, in that first kind of 45 minute viewing. And if I'd seen that on the on the wider screen, I think that would have been even more impressive. Ditto Wind River. Um, Hell or High Water, I didn't really feel that, to be honest. That, that, that was definitely one I was like, I probably could have watched that on an aeroplane, like on the on the little, you know, three-inch panel of an aeroplane. And I, I would have got everything I needed to from that film, to be honest. Um, but Wind River and Sicario. Wind River, I, I'm kind of glad I watched it at home because it worked out better with that snowy thing. I, I don't know why, I just really connected with it after that. And I couldn't stop thinking about it for a couple of days afterwards. Whereas I think Sicario and Hell or High Water, I didn't really think about them as much afterwards. Um, okay, I tell you what, let's get, well, let's have a little pause for the cause and then we'll be back with the spoiler section. Okay, so Rashad, which one should we tackle first? Or are we just going to kind of mostly focus on Wind River and then dip in and out of the other two films as well? Yeah. Yeah, let's, let it flow, let's let it flow. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, what made you kind of position this so highly on your year end list? Um, because I was a, because I was a big fan of the um, the um, Hell High Water and Sicario. So I was already on board with him, and he started talking about that that because I I read about the him calling him a trilogy, and like he didn't explain the movie before it, but I was already on board with the way he writes and the way the, the way those movies turned out to be. So I just sat there and I watched it, and it it is it is it, it throws me back to. And even this is even before all this Trump stuff went down. But as I'm watching the movie, it just threw me back to like how much. And as a black person, it kind of it, it, it kind of reminds me of like how much worse the Native Americans had it to this point. Like they don't they don't have any like like you watch it, it's like there's literally nothing. There's really no respect. And I and it takes me back to that um the the the, the dapple pop the pipeline. I don't know if anybody in Britain know about that one, where it's basically like they try to maintain their land. And this corporation wants to take over the land because they want to have the, the, the oil pipeline come across there. It's so like, even at that point, you give all this lip service about respect the Native Americans and blah, 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 like that. And then everywhere you turn, it's kind of like that situation where it's like, they just respect the left and right. And it's the fact of the matter of um, this movie. And it's kind of like that that concept of they, they raped and pillaged the Native Americans 
from the beginning, and they're still raping and pillaging them at this point right now. And then when he needs justifiable help, you give him as little help as possible, and then you have a situation where it's basically like, um, you, in order for an, an American to even, under, even come close to understanding it, you have to walk a mile in their shoes. And that's what Jeremy Renner's character did. And Elizabeth also represents the rest of us where we have no clue that this is going down. I mean, we sit there and we, we play lip service and stuff like that. But unless you're really in that situation, you can't understand it. And it goes back to what you were talking about earlier in the earlier section. Talking about how Jimmy Sher- like I think Taylor Sheridan um, was talking about how the fact of he's been around those people. He did the research. He's been around those people and literally with them. And he felt like if it was any other person that who had a, had a connection with it, it wouldn't have got done. And because he had the cash from Sicario and um, Hella High Water, they were okay with him kind of doing that movie because he proven himself with two movies to kind of go in there and do that and kind of have a situation. And, it, and it's cool because it was, the, it was the guy, I'm trying to think of his name, uh, Gil Birmingham. He was in Hella High Water as a, as a, as a deputy with um, Jeff Bridges' character, and he turned up in there in this movie too. So it seems like he has a good relationship with Native Americans because I'm pretty sure that most of them would not get involved with a movie like that if that guy didn't pay the proper respect to it or had the ear to listen to them and make sure it was represented correctly. So I think that was another thing that added to that. And Graham Greene is like a is like one of those uh, character actors that you know from years and years and years, and he played the sheriff in that movie. So I'm pretty sure that he wouldn't get involved with a movie like this if it wasn't representing their their people very well. So that was a lot of stuff that drew me in, into there. And it's the fact that the pedigree of Hella High Water and um, Sicario just drove me into this movie. And I just thought it was... And, Jeremy, and, and, I, and it is, this is another reason I love this movie is because it kind of reminds you why Jeremy Renner is Jeremy Renner. Because people get, see him as Hawkeye and then he tries to do these franchise movies like Jason Bourne and stuff like that. But people seem to forget that he, he cut his teeth and he got recognized for the Hurt Locker. And it kind of reminds you how great of an actor he is. And it's easy to forget about that when he's doing these blockbuster movies like The Avengers and Mission Impossible and um, Jason Bourne and stuff like that. But it just reminds you, like, there's just, just certain lines. Like, I lost my mother. And... And the line that he says to um to uh, Gil Birmingham's character when he lost his daughter, and he was saying to the extent of you have to take that pain in order for you to, to honor the memory of somebody you lost. You don't want to suppress that stuff. You have to take that pain and you take it hard. Otherwise, those memories you try to hold on to are going to disappear because you're trying to suppress them so bad. And that just like took me back to when I lost my parent. So it was just a lot of stuff that as a as a as a black person minority and just somebody who lost somebody like that just connected with me on like a deeper level. So that's. A, the, the main reasons why I enjoyed the movie. We're well, not enjoyed, but I love the movie. Yeah. I mean, just as a quick thing to the listener, we're going to assume that you've watched all three of these films. Um, if you haven't, then just, just go watch all three of them, because even if we won't be delving in into intense depth on the other two on Sicario and Hell or High Water, we will assume that you've kind of watched them because it's a bit different. It was a bit difficult to reference like Wind River without assuming that you've watched the first two films. Um, so if you haven't, then just, just stop and then come back to us basically um so i mean with with that basically okay jeremy renner i how do you think he did in this film i love him in this movie yeah i i think he did a really good job but there are there are a couple of things i think what you referenced before about taylor sheridan and his directorial debut about how he's still kind of working things out. I think that's spot on, to be honest. This isn't a perfect film. I think if you're expecting this to be a perfect film, it's not at all. Um, but it's really, it's still really good. And I, I think it's definitely promising. It kind of, it feels like a, a writer is directing it. And I, I, it's kind of like, you know, when in hip hop, you've got like someone says, oh, that's a producer rapper, as opposed to that's a rapper who can produce. It kind of feels a little bit like that at times in here, just on on a few things where you're kind of like, okay, this this could have been done better. There are certain aspects that could have been done better. I think Jeremy Renner's character is an absolute point in case, probably the biggest point in case, because even though he does a good job, there's two things I can't stand, right? First of all, he mumbles. So, and, and I didn't have subtitles. There were no subtitles in the bloody thing. And you literally, I don't know what he just said. I literally don't know what he just said at certain times. I'm sitting at home. Yeah, I could whack it up as loud as I like. And I, I can't understand what he's just said. To me, that's unforgivable. I know that that might sound ridiculous and a, a tiny, a, a complete nitpick. But it's crucial. He's he's actually giving these really important lines. Every line that he has is actually really crucial in this film. He is like the heartbeat of this film. And and I think it's things like that that 
I get that you're trying to sort of do a neo western and take it back to the when you know guys were guys and they used to mumble and John Wayne and rah 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 and all that kind of stuff. But actually, no, 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 you can't you can't really do that anymore. You, you just on a basic level, I need to understand what that person is saying. So that kind of rubbed my rubbed me up along. Uh, I, I guess that especially when I watched watched it first, that first forty five minute session, I was kind of like, no, no, I'm not feeling that. The second thing is, I think some of his lines are very kind of like a writer wrote this as opposed to this is what a real person would say because they're so po- so poetic or so the one that you referenced was great because that was like balanced as someone who's real and who's been through shit and it's like okay you've got to push part uh, push against the pain as you know uh, like embrace it almost but this other stuff it was kind of like okay this it sounds like a haiku right now i mean come on dog no one talks like that like literally you know not in westerns they didn't even talk like that back then you know uh, i think that's that's the kind of the slight immaturity of someone who's directing their first film, they kind of want to cram everything in. And and as we were saying before, you've got that simpleness of this film and the, the complex layers. And sometimes those complex layers, you can, you need to manage them a little bit and, and it can kind of run away from you a bit. So, but th- those are kind of like small things. In the end, like, I think the, the the biggest testament that I can give Wind River is that I really thought about it for two, three days afterwards. And I, I actually really want my wife to watch it. I'm not sure my wife would massively enjoy this film, but it's funny because she, you know, she watches Criminal Minds and she watches this and that, all those kind of shows. So it, it's not a million miles from that, to be honest. Um, but I get what you're saying about Jeremy Renner. I think this is definitely his lane much more so than like the Bourne film. Like I watched that Bourne film. I was like, Phew damn that was terrible that film and it wasn't his fault it's just that you know the film itself wasn't great and he was just completely miscast I felt whereas Hurt Locker he was good you know he's good as as that sort of small supporting role in the Marvel films and stuff and and I think this is this is good I think this is his lane like for the foreseeable future um how about Elizabeth Olsen's character um, she pretty much like I felt like she pretty much say, played the same role that Emily Blunt kind of played in um, in uh, Sicario, where it's like she's the person where she's like us. She's like that. She's like that. She's like the the audience, the character that's the audience. Like she's the one that has to get explained to everything about how this works and how that works and how this is what it is in a sense. So she's basically like the same thing. It's like it's like the same thing where like in Sicario, where it's like when you find out the because a lot of people didn't like the fact that the plot twist in the quote unquote plot twist in Sicario where it wasn't really um it wasn't really Emily Bunn's story at all. It was Benito Del Toro's story. You're just watching it as the as the quote unquote especially as an American, you're watching it as the American, you're being introduced into this world. And the only people who understand this world is a person like Benito Del Toro and the government, which is Josh Brolin. It's kinda of like you're always left in the dark. Like her and uh Daniel Kalua are basically like the guys like, okay, even he's in the military and he doesn't know and he and you would think he would have a better understanding, but even he's kept in the dark. And that's and that, and that's kind of like that kind of idea where it's like it's like the military brass, the government, the government brass, and the foot soldier, the soldiers on the bottom. It's like they don't they see the, the the situation on the ground, but they don't see the big picture. They just see the guys pointing in the direction and saying go, in that sense. And I think and I just, now going back to um, when River, it's it's even more it's even more so that she's not the main character and it's Jeremy Renner's story. Or matter of fact, it's the story of one River, but it's kind of like she's being led into the situation like the same way Emily Blunt is like okay I'm here for this but I don't understand everything that's going on and she's kind of like that person that who just reacts to certain things and I think that's her I think that's just her her role in the movie she's not meant to be the focal point she's just meant to be the character that as we're going through this 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 cold like art this cold area that we're the ones that are getting she's getting as we're getting explained to she's getting explained to so I felt like that's what her role was so I I didn't think it was anything like groundbreaking, but I didn't think she served her purpose as far as the plot goes. Yeah, I think Emily Blunt's character in Sicario was a bit more central to, although it, you're right, ended up being Benicio del Toro's story. But I think Emily Blunt was more front and center in that film. I think Elizabeth Olsen is um, what what I liked about that in particular, and I think I, I think I read this in what Sheridan was saying or a review, review or something like that, is that you don't get all the kind of useless stuff that you usually see in this films. You never see her on the phone with the FBI and like, you know, all that, that backstory and stuff. You you don't really get that much of her backstory. She's just like, Oh, you know, I was in Vegas. No, I was in Florida or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And that's kind of it. And 
I, I like that. I like it cut the fat from the from the film that because otherwise it really could have dragged on a bit. If you're kind of if you're going on about Elizabeth Olsen too much because she is a rookie. I, I think she's a rookie. She might be an FBI special agent, but she doesn't know what the hell she's doing. She's definitely a rookie in that situation as well, which is the most important thing. She, I mean, she turns up. She doesn't even have any clothes or anything like that, like any any winter clothes. Uh, I know that she explains that, but she ends up having to borrow like the the dead girl's clothes and stuff like that. Like a well. Uh, Jeremy Renner's no is it Jeremy Renner's daughter's clothes right yes, yes. yeah that's right and um, and and yeah the, it's kind of she she has a really tough role in this because I, I don't think she gets any room to run and actually kind of really be amazing in this film but it, she's almost like a supporting character in this to be honest for for much of the film um, and I think she does a pretty good job um, I think her her sort of the way that she's written is really intelligent as well she's almost one of my favorite characters in this like the way that she's written i think sheridan really did a great job with this it it can it almost seems a little bit hammy at times like for example when she gets maced and is shooting kind of almost semi-blind and stuff like that but i think that's just like a nice throwback to silence of the lambs because that was exactly the scene in there i think even sheridan might have said that so uh, i i kind of liked it i think i think pretty much everything worked um in her character and and it's actually really subtle especially when you kind of see that first 45 minutes twice you kind of see her her journey because she the funny thing is she fucks up massively uh, uh, quite a few times throughout this film and and even in the end i i think she fucks up again and um like hugely and and actually you get what four dead guys uh because that other cop already seen what was happening he's like he already knew he told us like listen they're flanking us right now yeah you didn't see it you didn't yeah. see it like like yeah. like and 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 it's funny because the, the way that I love how that was delivered like us jumping ahead a bit but how that was delivered was so kind of like to the audience as well it was just genius that film because it that it, it really makes you stop and consider everything you're like okay what is going on right now what it suddenly puts you in the state of tension along with the actual characters and she she messed up then she sort of pulled her authority I'm the FBI I'm the only one who actually has the authority on this land shut the fuck up all you lot blah 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 and and actually the end result is really bad for her. Jeremy Jeremy Renner isn't there. I mean she's dead. They're all dead basically, save for like one or two guys. And and I think that's what's interesting. But it's not kind of it's not I don't think you can position this as like a white saviour thing as much. Like I, I think I get I got a bit of criticism about that. I read a bit of criticism and but I I don't think it no. quite works like that. Because Elizabeth Olsen is not the white savior. She's she fucks everything up, really, to be honest. And and she's incredibly lucky. And I think she realizes that at the end, you know. Um the other thing I like is that there's no real hint of romance between the two characters because that would have been such an easy out, basically. Okay, you know, you've got him as the widow, widower, sorry, and um, and her and blah, 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 and there's a connection. It starts developing and all this kind of stuff. Even if it had been like in Sicario where that was like a, a, like a, a misdirection kind of thing. But there was no real hint of that, and I like that. There's so much I like about this film in terms of how lean it is and, and how to the point it sticks to the point really well actually and it it doesn't kind of lead you all over the place by your hand and you do have to figure things out as well um okay if we go into the plot a bit now because we've covered the sort of two main characters in essence what did you think of just the general plot of this and where it's positioned and you've got the kind of native american sort of aspect to things i mean at at the heart of it is the metaphor for how america treated native americans in a sense it goes right back down to situation where like the white men raped their children they murdered their children and then they sit there and they it, it, it's kind of like how how back in the day where they said we're going to domesticate the, the native americans and you find out that the domesticators were the ones that were the ones that were the terrorists in the sense you know what i'm trying to say it's like that situation where it's like you have this area that you you you, you shuttle them off and say okay here's where you have it we're, we're offering this to you but we're still going to come in and we're still going to take shit when we need to take shit in a sense so it's basically like when it because when it opens up, you hear the, you hear the poetry of Jeremy Renner's daughter, in a sense, talking about her her place, like the place that she loves, which is this place, in a sense, like that. And then you kind of find out the rest of the movie, it just opens up with a girl running, and you hear the voice of Jeremy Renner's daughter talking about this is her place. And then throughout the whole entire movie, you find out that that's not their place at all, in a sense. It's like there's still that reservation is nothing but a reservation. It's a it's a prison. It's a trap. It's like you talk about um the fact that. Um, you talk about his, um, you talk about Gil Birmingham's, his character's name is Martin Hansen, where his daughter died, 
And on the other hand, his, his son is a drug addict. And you, hear, and you see later on that Jim Renner talking to him. He's like, well, you had this opportunity to get, get out there and do what everyone wanted to do. And then he says, and then, and then, the, and then the, the brother of the, the, murdered, the murdered daughter says to him, he was like, How, you, you can't understand what it's like being here. And that's interesting considering the fact that Jimmy Renner's been there the whole time. So even if you're a person, a, a white person or outsider that's a part of that community, you still can't understand what those people are going through. Even, if, even though he had, even though the, uh, the brother had this whole opportunity ahead of him, it's like, how can you understand that? It kind of, it kind of reminds me of um, going back to uh, Black Panther for a moment. It's like, I've noticed a lot of people who saw Killmonger, they still don't understand certain aspects of why he did what he did and why he was so destructive. And it, and it kind of reminded me, and like, now that I think about it, it's like the same thing with that brother. It's like, you can't understand what being in a situation like that psychologically does to you and make you so self-destructive. You can't understand that. Even if you have that potential and opportunity to get out of that place, it's that institutionalized thing that, as far as I, I know as being a black man that grew up in the, in, in the inner city, but I've seen that institutional area where it's like, even though you have all the opportunities, just the fact that you're in that constrained area with little bit of resources and not enough not enough protecting you, you're going to kind of like be desolate and despair and destructive. And the, the other interesting part was um, the fact that at the end of the movie where the, um, where the father had um, ceremonial war paint on his face and then he's, and then this is how sad it is. And it also goes back to me being a black man. It's like your, your, your whole history, heritage is taken away. And he said to Jeremy Renner, he was like, I don't even, I was like, I'm putting this on my face. I don't even know what I'm doing because I haven't been taught this. So you're even on that level, even though they still, even though they weren't like ha- have their heritage taken away like black people were, like they still had it taken away in a different way. It, it wasn't as, it, it maybe wasn't been as, as definitive as how black people were when they got their whole history taken away from them. But they they had their history taken away from them through osmosis, it's like they just bleed, they just bled it out to the point where it's like they don't even know how to do what their ancestors did because they were so quote unquote domesticated and reformed to be adaptable to society. And then still, at the end of the day, you're still not a part of society. You're still left alone in that wilderness to be dealt to deal with what you got to deal with. So it's just a lot of stuff going on in there. Yeah, that line killed me. I have to admit that when he said, "You know, no one taught me this." Uh, that was just one of the best lines I've possibly seen in any film ever. It cut. It kind of cuts you so deep. It's really funny, actually, because um, I'm Gujarati. Like, like that's the area of India that my heritage is from, and uh, I understand Gujarati, but I don't speak it brilliantly. I don't read or write it anymore. Like I took classes when I was younger, but I've completely forgotten all of it. And me and my wife around the house, like we never speak Gujarati to each other. And we've got two small boys now. And, um, and, and it's funny, my, my son actually started Gujarati lessons. Well, not lessons, but a class, kind of like a sort of, you know, learning, singing, dancing class, whatever, like a couple of weeks ago. And, and he's just enamored by it. He's like, he's just turned four. And it's so funny because these things get lost in generations. You know, like, like my parents, you know, taught us Gujarati loosely because they'd already kind of come to this country and really thrown themselves into into this life and um and my wife's family god they, they never speak Gujarati to each other like in terms of the, the the siblings and stuff and and you kind of like it's such a shame because actually there's fucking like 80 million people in India right now in Gujarat who are perfect you know they've learned English but they have their Gujarati heritage and we do loads of other stuff but the most obvious thing which is language and that all these other kind of customs that we're, we're just losing because we're so kind of you know each generation it, it can these things can get lost really easily for no good reason because actually our culture Indian culture is so strong like we've talked about this on Black Panther if you talk about our film culture it's so strong if you talk about all the other aspects it really is strong so for us to be fucking up like that, like me and my wife, by not teaching our children the language, you know, language, you just and and when I was watching the film, when 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 he said that with the war paint thing, I was like, shit, man, come on, and and I guess it's no coincidence that maybe two weeks later I was kind of like, I think he needs to start classes, you know, and and it, and it's just really funny, like there are levels to this stuff, there really are, and and our situation is not similar to the Native American one. I'm I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that you can kind of take that and adapt it to your own life because things get lost very easily. Um, that that was one of the lines that really cut me up. Uh, I think it's also worth remembering. Okay, so Jeremy Jeremy Renner's character he married a Native American woman, and then they had that daughter, and then something happened to her. It kind of comes out in the film. It's still a bit coy. I don't know, like what actually happened to his daughter because he wasn't explicit about it, was he? 
No, because here's the thing. It's like they're implying that something similar happened to his daughter that happened to the other person's daughter. Because if you, cause even at the end of the credits, it's kind of like the point of like those girls go missing and they wind up dead. Because even at the end of the at the at the end of the movie, it shows that little like that little t- that that little title card saying that like, it, it it happens to these girls more often than what you realize. So it, it's trying to be too specific, but it's like trying to say like something similar, very similar happened to him. Cause remember, because remember she's like. Remember the, the cause he, he's got to tell the story about how um, he tells Elizabeth Olsen in the middle of the story. He says to her that the, the, they, the, him and the wife got, went away to have to have their couple's time, and then she, they darted through a party, and then it wound up happening that the party got bigger, and then after that something happened where she got taken away from the party and she wound up somewhere else and she was dead at that point. So like that's 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 as, like, as detailed as they probably get in the story, as far as like telling them what happened, but at this. But it's basically saying like they're implying that somebody who came came to the house that shouldn't have been there, and they got her, and they wound up murdering her and dropping her somewhere else off. So that's what the middle of the movie. Well, had. I, I think didn't he also say that the coyotes had had um, ravaged her body as well? So they couldn't yeah, they couldn't yeah. get any. So they really don't know what happened to her. Basically, exactly. And and then the funny thing is because he he found Natalie in time, like he found her within well, like the the next morning or whatever it was. And if he hadn't, because that was like a one in a million shot, basically. If he hadn't, then, you know, presumably we wouldn't know what really happened to her either. Because Matt's body, so later in the film, you find out that Matt, her boyfriend, um, his body is, is already sort of naked and starting to be eaten by wildlife and stuff like that. So, um, okay, so there, there's so much to talk about in this film, but it's it's kind of really all over the place. I, I think I, I kind of... There, there are many things that I took away from this film. I think the main thing is is just the treatment of women, but also the environment itself. Wyoming, like it, it's huge, right? I mean, okay, for, for me, I'm from the UK, so everything in every state in America is fucking eighteen times the size of the whole UK. So everything just seems huge to me. But it, it's such a harsh landscape, like, like even what do you call it? Elizabeth Olsen's character is really taken aback by it. You kind of assume she's probably never been somewhere like that before. And it's funny because I was watching Rocky Four last night, and I happened to be kind of on the Wikipedia page for it, and uh, and that's where they filmed the scenes that are supposed to be in Russia. They did it in Wyoming, um, so this really heavily snowbound thing, and uh, and and I think it's it's kind of such a head fuck to me because you know I don't know that much about the Native American experience, and you know I kind of know various things about the backstory and everything like that, but but the current situation I don't really know much about it, and so when when I, I don't know who it was. I don't know if it was the chief, the, what do you call it? Uh, Graham Greene's character, the, the police sergeant. I don't know if it was him saying it or if it was Elizabeth Olsen, but the six police officers policing, what what did they say? Like a, a an area the size of like New Jersey or Newark yeah. or something like that. Something crazy. I don't know. Some huge area. He was six police officers in those conditions. I mean, the, this is why people do what they do with impunity. They, they're basically going to get away with it 99 times well, probably more than that, like out of a hundred. Which, and, if you think about it, if you think about it, that's how those guys when they raped the the, the daughter, like they were like, okay, whatever, we can do. What yeah, we can do. yeah. Like they didn't even, they didn't even hesitate to do that. Yeah, it was like, okay, we 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 know we're gonna go in there because remember the guy said later on he was like, he was like, I just wanted some action. Like we're we're guys out there. He just he tried to justify his action talking about we're we're in the middle of nowhere. There's no girls around. What do you expect us to do? He said that to Jeremy Renner. So that's how their mindset even goes. How their morals just just easily just fly off because in their minds they've seen that happen many times before. Because if you thought if, if that's the thing with law, if you know there's gonna be repercussions, unfortunately with humanity, you need law because if you le- <laughs> if you left mankind's own designs, then we, that stuff will happen all the time. But if you don't have a healthy amount of law in the area for for good or bad, then people will think twice about doing what they want to do. Yeah, and this shit happens every day all over the world. You know. Like I think that that was kind of another thing. You've got the the even though this seems like a macro of Wyoming, it's actually a micro of the world because this constantly happens. E- even if this is specifically about the kind of Native American experience, especially for women, um, I, I think that's that's another interesting thing with Taylor Sheridan is that when you read about it, he actually properly you know, spent time with the Native Americans. Like I think, I think he said. Um, I'm going on this from memory, but I think in his mid twenties or something like that, uh, or around that time, he kind of, he spent like six to 12 months maybe. Um, and he actually lived there and fully committed to that lifestyle. 
uh, and this it sounds weird me saying that because like how can like a white guy just adopt a lifestyle for six to 12 months you know and then just go back to being oh i'm a white guy now i'm on tv i'm an actor blah 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 but it's funny because it seems to all intents and purposes this really grabbed him and he really you know he he was an actual part of it and they accepted him properly and that's what enabled him to translate this into an actual script and then to screen and that's why he was so protective he said this is the one he was the most protective over he didn't want anyone else touching it this is the one that he wanted to baby because it, it had so much resonance with him and and i think he's done i mean do you think he's done a good job I absolutely think he did a good job. It's yeah. Like I said, like directing techniques aside, because you always learn. Like this, I mean, I mean, because that's technically that's like his second or third time he did like a bunch of smaller movies to warm up, like really low budget ones. I think this is the one with the, the first one with like a proper budget. I think he cut his teeth a little bit on the other ones, but there's always a big difference between cutting your teeth on a low budget like shoot, like guerrilla style shooting, and then you get like the kind of like a thirty or forty million dollar um, budget to kind of do something that's a bigger responsibility, and then that's the Dalton for any first time director. Kind of manage that kind of thing like that, but for a first time, to, for, but for a first time director of holding that kind of responsibility down, I think he did really well. Like I said, I think there's always room for there's going he's going to do if he continues to direct because I I think he said he's not sure if he wants to direct again because I know Sicario too he's just writing again. So I, from what I understand, like he's not too sure if he's ever going to direct again, but he's continue writing. So I don't know if that experience was a pro or a con for him, or if it was just out of out of control for him something like that. But I, we'll see in the future. But um, but as far as that, like I said, the, the the writing and the intent and getting the point across, I think saved it from any other deficiency from directing, if there were any. You know what I'm trying to say? So it's like, and it's consistent with the tone of the other two. So there is a to- there is a there is a kind of like a trademark tone that he has at this point. Like you can kind of see at this point, like like if you see a three or four four like if you see four like 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 like, like six or seven more movies from him or like total. Six, seven, one movies. I'm pretty sure that there's going to be a kind of like his stamp on how to write or whatever like that. But um, I thought he did a great job doing it. It's not, it's not like an all time great of all time thing. But I think as far as his body of work, I'm impressed by that. Like I, I'm taking, I'm taking, I'm taking him the three movies that he has at this point right now, and I'm just saying like I'm very excited to see what he does in the future. But as far as this movie by itself, I think it's very good with the strong intent. Do you know what's really funny? That that was a great summation. That was going to be my last point, but I totally didn't mean that. I was talking about the Native American thing. How do you think he handled the, the Native American aspect of this? Like, did, was it sensitively handled, or do you think you know? I I don't know. Like, I feel like this. I feel like this is an outsider. I feel like those those actors would not have gotten involved. I always feel like the same thing with Black Panther. I feel like those actors would not have gotten involved if he didn't treat it with the respect that he did. They they were the they were the co signed for me. To, to take it as this is going to be somewhat like relatively, you can never be 100% authentic in, in, in film because you have to take dramatic license for certain things, but you have to get to the core of the truth. And like I said, if those people didn't get involved with that movie, then I would have been like, uh, I don't know. But because of the goodwill with the last two movies and the fact of the matter that he had another actor from another movie come in and join him, that's a, a reputable Native American actor, it felt, it, it felt like he did it justice. I can't say 100% because I'm not involved in that group. I'm just going by I'm just going by the logic that I'm allowing myself to go through, and from what I felt, I felt like he handled it responsibly. Even with the rape situation, like he didn't he did he did he didn't over he didn't he showed that it was it, it was terrible, but he also didn't like like lean into it like disgustingly. You know what I'm trying to say? Like he didn't try he didn't make it look like 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 it was like you know sometimes Hollywood when they do sex scenes or rape it, it wasn't like, fetishized at all. Exactly, that's what I'm looking for. That's yeah. what I'm looking for. He didn't fetishize it so. Even even the violence in his movies, like it's very violent, but it's not like it's not gratuitous violence. It's showing you the how stupid it is. Like most of the time in the violence in these movies, it's either tragic, disgusting, or or, or ridiculous of why we're doing it in the first place. And it is ridiculous. American violence is very ridiculous. Nine nine times out of ten in America, the violence can be avoided. Nine times, you know, man. Be honest with you, nine point five times out of ten, it could be avoided if people got their shit together. But we don't. So. That's a that's a very that's that's one of the things I appreciate about these the movies. It doesn't hide away from that fact that it's in our it's in a, it's in. I mean, the world has its issues with violence too, but um, as an American looking being on the inside looking at what's going on, it's like there's two there, there's two halves of this country. It's like 60 percent of us wants to get over violence. We're not fans of all this bullshit, and then there's like that forty percent still holding on to that old wild west 
way. And every day, and every time we the other the other part of the country tries to push against it, they push right back against us. It's like that. It's like that. It's like it's almost like the civil war is still going on, but it's going on through government rather than through war in a sense. And so jumping back to these movies, it's like that violence in that area could have easily been avoided if if everybody was aware. And the one guy that was aware, he was held back by the by the government official type of FBI, like, oh, I know what I'm doing, blah, 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 blah. And, and, and then it goes to shit at the end. It's like sometimes our government doesn't know what the fuck it's doing because it's not on the ground looking at people. It's looking at it. There's, there's an important thing with, and, and, and I think he kind of goes at it. It's like you have to understand the macro and the micro. And too many times our government just looks at the macro and not look at the micro, and that's why the shit's the way it is. And then on the flip side... On 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 the citizens level, we look too far into the micro and we don't see what the macro is, and that's why we don't see the effect. And it's kind of going, and it goes back to that thing with with the, with, with this movie. It's like all three, like Del Toro's character, um, um, Renner's character, and um, Chris Pine's character, like they all have something in common. They all three lost something, whether it's financially, whether it's whether it's by by um. Or personal or whatever, it's like they all have something in common, and if everybody would just see what the other person was going through, then we would, we would all be able to solve the sovereign pattern. But then it's like this thing, at least in our, at least in my country, it's like okay, they have it worse than we have it, we have it worse than they have it. This morning, I, I I put a tweet out there. It was like there was an argument about light skin and black skin people who had it worse, and I'm like, oh my god, Jesus Christ! It's like we all have, we're all black, we all have just experience with like, can we listen to we fucking, can we fucking listen to each other? understand what the fuck is going on rather than saying this person had it worse than this person we all had it we all have a bad in different ways we need to come together and understand to make sure it never happens again and i think a lot of it is when you watch these three movies together it's like there is something fucked up but if only people actually fucking seen what the problem was the stuff that the native americans are going through is just as important as what those guys in the midwest are going through and just as important as what the people on a border the border states and and mexico are going through like we're all dealing with the same shit in different ways, and we need to kind of like take a look at that and seeing what we have in common rather than what we what's separating us. In a sense. And it, and Sheridan even said that he was like he said in an interview he was talking about how he was like like the two parties don't represent us because they're so interested in keeping this division, and like and, and it's basically like and he's kind of showing you in these three movies like these three different areas have so many things in common than they realize, but it's, it's it's all separate and keeping it it's all kept separate from each other and it's weird. So, yeah, I, I mean, there's like a sort of a few points to wrap up on Wind River before we kind of jump quickly into the other ones. Um, that confrontation scene with between the security guards and, and the visiting officers, um, I seem to remember, I think he said that him and his team, all they did for three weeks or something was just look at actual video footage of confrontations in the, uh, that exactly that kind of style, like an armed standoff, basically. And it's, he said it was really fascinating, like apart from them getting obsessed by watching these things, that how how quickly these things actually escalate and how quickly they play out. Like, it's not like, you know, it's funny, like the one in Hell or High Water at the end is kind of like that typical kind of Wild West thing. You've got someone with a rifle, you know, 100 yards away, pew, and then they shoot back at him, pew. And then it's kind of like, whereas actually this kind of thing is nothing like that. It's kind of like suddenly there's this nervous tension and then everyone draws their weapons and then either it escalates or then suddenly it just kicks off and everyone is dead within six seconds, basically like all that, that kind of like ridiculous thing. Like it's a matter of seconds and everyone's lives have changed. And, and, and that, that, that bit was fascinating. And then I thought what was really interesting is kind of like that one of the, the one of the security guards, the chief security guard says, you know, when she, when she's knocking on the door of that cabin, you know, he specifically says, you know, Pete, there is an FBI member out here, you know, knocking, for, which was such an obvious thing that she missed out on. You know, he's yes. clearly warning her. And again, that was another rookie error that really screwed up. And bang. And then then it goes straight into the flashback, which I actually really liked, I have to admit. And um, and the guy, Matt, I think I forget the actor's name. It's uh, it's uh, John Bernthal. Yeah, John Berthold. Yeah, yeah. He was so in, he, um, Sicario he's in too. Sicario. Yeah, so he. It's funny because he's the bad. He's one of the bad guys in Sicario, and like a shock bad guy as well. It's really cleverly done, and um, and in this, he you you think, oh shit, here we go. He's going to be the bad guy again, kind of thing. But actually, it turns out he's not. Um, and I, I think the flashback was. So the flashback is the only thing in in the film really that's the flashback. I think from memory, and it explains 
everything that we need to know effectively. Um, so, so Matt is, uh, with Natalie. They're having, you know, they're in love, blah, blah, blah. He's a perfectly good guy. She's lovely. And then, then the security, his, you know, his colleagues come back after a night, a night of hard drinking. And then it's Pete. This guy is completely out of control and he tries to, you know, you know, he's probably just, well, it's funny because, yeah. I've read reviews and I've listened to sort of reviews of this and stuff. And it's quite funny. It's frequently by white guys who are, who are writing this stuff or doing the podcasts on it. And I, I don't want to like piss off any white listeners, especially white men, you know, like, and like just group you all into the same kind of thing. But it, it's funny how, it's funny how people diminish what the security guys were doing. And, and like, it's almost like I, was, I literally I was listening to this thing and, and one of the guys on this podcast was saying, well, you know, it's just drinking and, and it's what happens sometimes and it just escalated and it's unfortunate. <laughs> what the <laughs> fuck? What? And I was like, I was like, what? I was like, I think we read this in a different way, dude. Kind of, th- you know, and like, it's just really, it's really amazing. And like, he was more, he was more interested in talking about the rape scene and like the specifics of the rape scene. I was like, Okay, man, you're fetishizing this, and you're completely missing the point of what th- that whole flashback was really about. You know, like if you want, you can talk about the details and stuff about you know on a technical level and everything. But he 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 was he was sounding creepy as fuck. Plus, missing the point. Plus, being I'm sorry, but like someone uh, like a white guy who does not understand the whole point of this film, right? Can I say something real quick. I'm sorry. Go go ahead. Ahead. No, no, it's okay. Go on. No, because it, it kind of reminds me of like, okay, so I was somewhere. I can't say where I'm at because in case people are listening. I was somewhere, right? And this goes back to what you're saying. And, isn't, and like I said, like I said, there's a civil war in my country with white people. It's like there's white people who want to get along with everybody and move on. And there's the white people who are still stuck in the path and still expect everything. Like, like, I had, like I had somebody tell me, a white guy tell me, he was like, I don't know why I have to understand what other cultures go through. It's like, I, I, I'm good enough right here. And I'm like sitting there, I'm like, if you understand what other cultures go through, then we can solve the problem a lot better. If you don't understand what other cultures go through, then how can you not do that? Nobody's attacking your whiteness. We're just saying, like, there are certain specific situations that have to happen. But anyway, so getting back to, so, so talking about the movie thing for a little bit. So I walk, so, I, so, I, so I'm walking down the hall, and I see three white guys, and they're talking about Black Panther. And then the one guy was like, well, I don't see what the big deal about that movie is, blah, blah, blah. I don't know why it's so special. Why are they making it bigger than what it is, yada, yada, yada. And I'm sitting there, and I'm listening, and I'm, and I'm listening to them talk. I'm like, I'm like, if you did your research, and these are educated guys, and I'm sitting there like, if you just took like five seconds to even look at what's going on at the point right there and pay attention to the thing, it's like, it's like it's not saving, it's not saving civilization or something like that. I'm like, it's got nothing to do with that, dog. It's just like you're explaining what other people are going through by a certain perspective. We're all used to your perspective at this point. We all understand that perspective, and like, and like going, and this is, I'm round right about to go on what you're saying, what you're talking about when you're talking to other guys. It's like you have to kind of go beyond your understanding of the world. For, if, if you want to be honest with you, we're, we all have incomplete, an incomplete piece of the puzzle about how, how the world, world really works. And that's why movies like Wind River are important to kind of see that other different aspect. Because if you never because if you never got those stories told out in public, and it's not just about Academy Awards and all this other bullshit. It's the reason why art is so important. It tells us about ourselves. And if you have one group that they consider their story like important or their story is like, I don't even know anybody else's story but mine. And that's why we're in this fucked up situation that we are in right now. That's why you got people voting to get out the EU because you think everybody's your enemy. You got people in our country who voted for the for this jackass because they thought that he was the most qualified guy for the job because they supported his their viewpoint about the, where the country wanted to go. It's like you have to understand art is a communication, and for you to not even engage on it at least or at least or at least we know that I did a podcast or at least listen to other people who were involved in that kind of area or read about that area or watch documentaries about the area. You would be more educated about it, but I think there's this arrogance sometimes that these people have, that these, cer- these certain white people have, that they don't just don't grow past that, and they're stuck in that box, and that's why shit is fucked up. Now I'm not saying like other minorities don't have fucked up, fucked up people in their group. We do, but for so long, you guys have been the main perspective, and you guys have to understand that in order for us to evolve, you have to understand at this point the world's getting smaller, and you have to understand that, and you can't fight that. All this nationalism is not fucking working, so. It is what it is. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, and I, I like. To, I'm just going to sort of wrap things up quickly. I like how Jeremy Renner kind of did that. Uh, how he kind of ended up kind of getting rid of Pete basically without getting rid of him. I think that that was a clever thing because 
I'm sure I'm not the only person. When I saw that clip of the mountain lions, you know, I'm sure a lot of people were thinking, yeah, he's going to feed them to the mountain lions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and actually, that was like one of those Taylor Sheridan misdirections. So that was quite clever. Um, the, the last thing that really I'd say is um, uh, that title card at the end saying that, you know, this, this is basically kind of... Um, what do you call it missing person statistics are kept for every demographic group except for native american women whose numbers remain unknown that i think that's basically the the sort of overarching point of this whole film and th- this is where i think taylor sheridan you know he's sort of, i think he's really paid respect to the native american community and i think he's tried to handle this as sensitively as he can yes he's a white guy but i i think who else kind of I'm not going to say who else could have done this or anything like that, but I'm just saying this is clearly something that's really important to him. And, and this is, you know, the script was his baby and, and this was crucial to him. And I think he's done a good job here because it really made me think, I was like, damn, you know, because like in India, like women have, oh, Jesus Christ, women just have just got raped and killed and completely off the map. No comeback for the guys at all still to this day constantly you know pro- i think it's something ridiculous like every sort of six seconds or something stupid yeah, i read like about that, that stuff for like- yeah and, and like it really came to a head in kind of the wider media about um about five years ago there was like this whole case called the nearby one where, where this woman was taken actually a woman and a guy they got onto a bus like a and it turned out that it was kind of a bit of a trick bus so they were on a date or something and then basically that they, they they beat the guy up chucked him out and then they they raped this woman and the things they did to her are just so so appalling like and she ended up dying through the injuries like within 24 hours like they just dumped her on the side of the road and to be honest like ni- like you said 99.5 times out of 100 they would have got away with it but for some reason they didn't this time and and then i ended up seeing a, a play about it in the edinburgh festival and stuff like that and and it just I think it really affected a lot of people because the, it was so shocking what they did. Like, I, I don't want to talk about it, but you, you can just go Google it, basically. N-R-R, N-I-R-B-H-A-Y-A. That's like what she was, that's what the case was referred to. That wasn't her name. Like, you get it, basically. And and so in India, like, it, it's really become a huge thing now whenever, like, something like this happens. But actually, the reality is the 99 times it does happen you don't really get it in the media you know it's just the odd one here or there that happens to be particularly shocking or a particularly young girl or anything like that so so for the very fact that there are no missing person statistics you know I'm sorry I'm not laughing out of like hilarity I'm just like in complete disbelief you know that Native American women you just literally don't know what's going on and and like people are just walking around with impunity doing what they like and it's just shocking it's just you know, and I think that's what the point is of this film, really, that Taylor Sheridan's trying to get across to us. It's like, okay, what are we going to do to uh, do about this? You know, it's, it's the ball is out in our court now. Now that we know this information, it might have woken a lot of people up. Okay, what's going to happen now? Because otherwise it's just, you know, in 10 years time, people are going to be watching this film thinking, well, pff, nothing changed. Okay, that was a great film. It's great that you raised awareness, but what's actually going to happen about this now? Um I think I think that's the, like one of the massive successes of this film. To be honest, it really made, I couldn't stop thinking about it. To be honest, for a, for like two three days afterwards, it's kind of like with in a completely different way, but with Mother because I know like you chose Mother. We did a podcast on it. I watched it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And when I was watching it, I was kind of like, yeah, this is fine. This is good. La 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 la. But then actually, like two three days afterwards, I could not stop thinking about that film. And with Wind River, it's it's kind of similar, but you know, for completely different reasons. And I, I think that's the kind of hallmark of something that really gets into your brain. And, and that's what's interesting to me about this film particularly. Forget about the technicalities, forget about the plot points, this, that. You know, I think it's just, it just really shocked me. It really shocked me. And, and then it made me want to learn because then I started reading more about the Native American experience like that's currently going on. So, um, and, and then, then, then after that, I watched Hello, High Water. So we'll, we'll sort of jump to those two films, the other two films, like quickly, just sort yeah. of wrap them up. Sorry, what were you going to say? No, I was going to say, I mean, that's... Sometimes people like when people say, "Oh, it's not going to change anything." I was like, "If it, if it reaches the right, it's, it's, there's always a thing with art where it's like, of course it may not change anything, but it can all be. You, it's, it's it's like one. It's like it's like a person a person that could change something significantly in this in this world is one like um, what's I'm looking for? Is one inspirational way of trying to change things. Like you don't know who's going to watch what. That's why it's important to get 
That's why not only is it important to have actual facts in the world, stuff like that, it's important to have art tell stories about each other because sometimes you can watch something and go, damn, wow, I should really do something about that. You know what I'm trying to say? And it, it may not be everybody, and it, and it may not be able to save all those people, but you can kind of see the, the, like, like the situation in your area and do something about it. Like, you just never know what's going to inspire somebody to do whatever. So I, I usually get annoyed. I'm not, I know you're not saying it. I usually get annoyed by the people that dismiss stuff like, well, it's not going to change anything. I was like, it may not change anything, but who knows who might see that and might react on that. That's the kind of point of it. I mean, do I have, I, I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm, I'm like a super Libra. Like I'm, I'm, I'm positive and nev- negative balanced. So even though I do, even though there's a part of me that thinks the world's fucked, I also have this part that has hope at the same time. You know what I'm saying? It's a weird balance to kind of have. It's like, I, I still believe in individuals that can make a change, even though it may not affect the the, the bigger hole, and then sometimes I think sometimes they can do that, but it takes it's, 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 it, to be a human and to be a civilized human being it's, it's an everyday job, and you may not be able to like change the world every day, but you can do your small part by not being an asshole or at least doing something kind to somebody else another day, so, so for people to say like, oh, it's not going to change anything, that usually pisses me off, because like, you never know how somebody's going to react to certain things, like you said before, like you never knew about all this stuff, so, it, so you did more research and stuff like that now, what you do with it, you may do something with that information, you may not do something with that information, but at least you educated yourself. You know what I'm trying to say? It makes you a better human being by that. That's what art is supposed to do. Whether it's music or a play or a film or a painting or whatever, it's supposed to inspire you to be a better person or at least have some kind of understanding about how humanity is. Yeah, and we would be remiss if we didn't mention this sort of elephant in the room right now because this was originally released by the Weinstein Company and then following all his uh, sexual abuse allegations, I'm going to have to say that word right now because allegations, um, not that that fucker would listen to this, but the, the, the uh, distribution uh, distribution rights were acquired by Lionsgate and then the Weinstein credits and logo were omitted and they lost distribution rights and all this kind of stuff. And then, uh, and uh, you know, you look at what the plot of this film is, and uh, that there is a fucking gigantic dose of irony there. You know, it really is, especially with the timing of it, everything, because it was, I mean, it was really tr- originally released in Sundance, like back in January 2017, but I think its theatrical release was was August, and then like what, like a month later or something like that, like yeah. the, sh- the shit really hit the fan for for Weinstein. Okay, um, I mean that that kind of wraps up Wind River. What I mean, we're not going to delve into Hell or High Water or Sicario like properly, but it, it's worth talking about them just for a few minutes, basically. So, I, I ended up watching Hell or High Water after I watched Wind River. Uh, I think like the same night or something. So, so what did you think of Hell or High Water? Like to me, I see them all as one piece. So I I love them equally for different reasons. In a sense, I just like the like to me, I was impressed by. I, I always knew Chris Pine was a good actor. But I always felt like he, like I always felt like when he did the blockbuster stuff, like that was kind of like that, that kind of like, like he's good at the blockbuster stuff. But I always felt like he wanted to do more, and like I felt like this is one of the movies where like you really get to see that that he there's more to him than just being like the Captain Kirk blockbuster Jack Reacher kind of guy. I mean, I, and and then um, Jeff Bridges is always good. It's like I just like the fact that it goes back to what I was saying before. It's like this is this is like that this is like the anti. Um, make America Great Again movie. You know what I'm saying? Like it's not it's not about the people who are like fearful about everything and everybody else. Their anger is directly focused on the banks. It's not anger about other minorities and this and that. Even that one scene in the um casino where Ben Foster who plays um um uh Tana. Pine's brother. Yeah, yeah, he plays Pine's brother and he's in the casino and he's playing with an American guy and they're talking about Comanche. And then he's and how they talk about how they're both Comanches in a way. Like you it, it seems like he's being racist against the dude. And then they kind of come to like understanding like okay, your people got fucked over and now now look now it only it was only a matter of time before we got fucked over. And I think that was kind of the it's kind of like part of the theme of the movie in a sense. It's like when you fuck other, when you fuck over other people to take over their shit, it's only a matter of time before the same people that fucked them over are going to fuck you over. And the banks are the the banks that fucked you over were the same banks that fucked them over, just in a different form, in a different era, in a sense. And I always and I feel like. And like before, before I continue on with Hell High Water, I feel like that line in that line of Sicario, I got it right in front of me. I think that line sums, sums up all these, all three movies. And then when uh, Benicio del Toro says to you should move to a small town where the rule of law still exists, you will not survive here. You are not a wolf, and it's a land of wolves now. And I say those banks, those banks, that's that. Those are the wolves in that movie. I feel like that's the wolf in that movie that are preying on those people, and where it causes people like Chris Pine, who normally didn't want to do shit like that. They go from different times, call different methods. Because they're like just small little details in that movie. Like like the um 
like the um the waitress. Yeah. Like she gets a tip. She wants to get the tip. She wants to get the tip back. She's like, I gotta pay fucking bills. What do you want me to do? About it's half my mortgage, you know. That <laughs> exactly, exactly. And you see it all over the place. And you see Jeff Bridges like l- just lamenting. Like like he's he's realizing like, okay, we're not really doing anything about this in a sense, in a way. Even though he still has to like be that that cop thing and he has that he wants to have that vendetta against uh Chris Prime because his partner got killed. But there's a there's, there's there's somewhat of like a begrudging mutual understanding at the end of the day. Like okay, you're the cop and I'm the robber. If you want to handle it, you want to handle it. But I have I make and Chris Pine, I make no apologies for what I did. At the end of the day, I have to take care of my family, and that's how it is. If you want to, and in a way, it's kind of like in a way he's going after. And, and, and the funny thing about it is the law is going after the wrong people because the law actually went after those those banks that ripped these people off with these with these with these predatory actions and stuff like that. Then these people wouldn't be in a position to do this kind of thing. The law is pointing in the wrong direction. And the wolves are pointing them in the wrong direction. So it's like, that's the thing I got from that movie. I think it is a, a Make America Great Again like film because actually Trump would love to take it back to 2010 where, and, and he is the bank, basically. He's the, the shady bastard who's who's putting out all these predatory kind of contracts and and, that, and, sense, and stuff and, like that. Sense, and, and like, yeah, and just kind of like, you know, land grabbing things and this and that and, and you know, deliberately bankrupting people so that he can get their land that's exactly what he wants i bet if if you gave him the choice right now not to get too trumpy all that kind of stuff but if you gave him the choice right now you know if he could set up like another recession where they will be able to foreclose the shit out of things and he can just land grab all this stuff and all his rich mates can land grab all this stuff because they've been accumulating wealth right now he would do it like i'm telling you that that's something that Americans have got to be really get. Make sure you people have fucking paid off your mortgages and shit, or make sure you've got enough to pay your mortgages, and and read all the contracts that you sign because Trump will try and do this stuff, and the people that he rolls with will try and do this. This is how he made his money, for God's sake, you know. This is literally how he made his money. So you know, I think it's really clever this film because. Okay, this was released before he was president and stuff. I'm not saying that or anything like that. But it's really clever, this film. And, and you're right. There's so many little kind of gems in the script that have really that really center around the bank more than anything or around money more than anything. Like the waitress. The waitress is the star of this film. <laughs> she, she, it's, it's funny because, like, we're not going to go on about this film too long, but I think Jeff Bridges' character was, I don't know, I was kind of... Okay, I get it. Jeff Bridges, he did a good job. The character's quite nuanced because he's crotchety old. He's clearly racist. Or he's trying to toughen up, you know, Gil Birmingham's character. All this kind of stuff, whatever, whatever. I, I think I think it was it was an interesting role and stuff, but I didn't really take to him. I, I don't know if maybe I'm just kind of a bit tired of that kind of character, to be honest. But even though it was, it was well done and it was more nuanced than I'm painting it out to be. Um, and, and, and like the irony is that, you know, he's the one who's retiring. He's the one who's this and that and, and it's his partner who is you know ethnically diverse who gets shot and killed you know it, because it always is isn't it it's always a fucking mexican or native american that gets killed in these scenarios yes and and you know if you take that as a macro or a micro you know or historically or, or whatever and i i don't know that there's a lot about this film that I, I it doesn't feel like like a best film oscar nominee kind of thing to me like when i when i was watching it or anything but I guess it's one of these films where if you kind of digest it afterwards and, and start thinking about things, then, then maybe if you were kind of in the in the committee, you might have got hoodwinked into sort of like that kind of thing. I, I don't know. It's quite a, it's quite a funny one like that. Um, I mean, but I mean, forget about the Oscars. Uh, I just think it, I just think it was it was a well handled film and it moved on uh, moved along at a good rate because this is the kind of thing where I think this could have gone a bit wrong to be honest. Um, like it. There was a point where I was kind of like, okay, this is going into no country for old men territory, but not in a good way. This seems that it, it kind of almost got to a pale imitation of it. But then the whole bank thing really kicked in. And that's what I think saved the film. I think that's the heart of the film, to be honest. Um, okay, should we talk about Sicario? Sure. Because because Sicario 2 is going to come out pretty soon, actually, isn't it? Um, so, so what did you think about Sicario, then? To me... It's- to me, Benicio del Toro is is the like that's one of my favorite performances. From just that table scene alone, to me, I feel like I feel like that table scene and the scene he has with um with Emily Blunt at the end where he makes her sign the contract. To me, that sums up all three movies for me. Like he's just like he he's like the the character that sets this whole trilogy off in a sense, and then everything that follows kind of like reverberates with that like the line I just said with you right there. And to me, I just feel like 
Like, I mean, D- Denis Villeneuve, he's one of my favorite directors right now. Like, everything I've seen him do, from Revival to Prisoners to um, Sicario to Blade Runner, I'm looking forward to his Dune movies. Like, to me, he can't. He's, he's on. I almost. Uh, depending on how Dune is, I almost say he's. It's going to be blasphemy. I almost, I almost think they, he's a better director than, um, than Nolan. And I love Christopher Nolan. I think he's on one of them runs right now. And Sicario was like, when I first saw it, I was like just flabbergasted by it. I just thought it was like, it's not, and the thing with these Taylor Sheridan movies, the writing and far direction, they're not, they're, the thing I love about them is they're not, you know how you said it's not Oscar, he's not Oscar worthy? To me, I, I'm, I said, that's a good thing. They're not showboaty. They're not like that, like, you want to see that clip and it's like, <laughs> I lost my son. <laughs> I'm not saying that, I'm not, not, I'm not saying that. You know what I'm saying? I'm not. I'm not negating that. Like you, like you, like you know what I'm talking about. They're not yeah. Oscar bait movies. That's why when you say when you say that they're not Oscar worthy, I, I, I to me, I say that's a badge of honor. Personally. That's a compliment. Yeah. That's a to me as a compliment because they're not. Because I know you say they're sometimes they're writing and this and that, but I feel like they're just like there's those movies. These are the movies that you that they used to make in the and like I'm not one of the people like where well, the 70s were a great time because they made adult films. I'm not that kind of person. I'm not. I'm not that 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 stodgy. But I will say, like these movies, kind of remind me of like those, like that, like those movies, like Serpico and Dog Day Afternoon. Those movies where it's like they were made for adults, but they also weren't like uh, they also weren't like um, <laughs> like hoity toity. You know what I'm saying, like it's not for the common folk. Like this is these are movies that anybody can get if they're if they're in the right mood to watch them. They're they're, they're not talking down to you, but if you want to get more out of them, you can and stuff like that. So, so cut back to Sicario. I was like, to me, it's like I watched Sicario the first time, right? And it was good. And then, like, when you get to the end, it's like, holy shit! You get to that that dinner scene, it's like, holy shit! And then you watch the movie again. Sicario is one of the movies like it gets better the second time you watch it because once you find out what the end goal is, and you watch the movie again, and you start finding all the little details after that. These are one of the movies where, like, when you watch the first time, like, eh, it's okay, and then you get shocked by the end of it. But I feel like once you watch and you get what the point is at the end of it. And you go back and watch it. You saw all the little details that the government, ne- like, like, like the, all the loopholes they try to weave through to get to there and what stuff like that. And it opens up. And then you watch it. And you could you watch it. You follow with Emily Blunt, right? But then you watch it. Do you watch it again? And you realize but Del Toro is the guy that takes over at the end. And you start watching him. The second time you go through, that's where the movie really opens up like that. So for me, like, to me, like out of the three, to to me, I would if you hold a gun to my head, I might say Sicario is the best one. But it's like, but for me, per, but me being mercenary about the three movies. But to me, I feel like it's neck and neck with Wind River in certain ways. But if you put a gun to my head, I would say this one is still my favorite out of the three, and it's just because that that table scene I think is the, it arguably might be the best scene out of all three movies. That fact right there, like just that's how the world is right there. And the other scene with him and uh, um, Emily Blunt at the end of it, the Land of Wolf scene. Yeah, which table scene do you mean? Do you mean? Do you mean the- when, he, when he comes in? When he comes in from okay, I'll I'll, I'll take it back. From, from the time when they go into that, when they go into that um that 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 um that that tunnel that goes from America to Mexico, like from the time he's driving in the car with the with with the guy, he finally gets in there. He gets he gets he he gets in the car with the cop, and he starts driving to go to the guy who's going to rendezvous with the drug the drug the drug lord, right? Yeah. From that moment, from that moment where he's in the car with the cop. To um the, to the dinner he, table scene. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Where, fine. Fine. Yes. That's what I thought you meant. Yeah. yeah. From that moment, I'm from that moment to there. I think that's arguably the best moment out of all three movies. Like that's just like like for me as far as like a, like like the direction, the writing, the acting. It's like I've never been that tense. Like holy shit, because the movie kind of like kind of lulls you into it in a way. Because you like we watch around like where the fuck is this movie going? <laughs> Once he gets in that car, Jesus Christ, he just takes over the fucking movie. Like oh my god, yeah. Do you, do you know what? Like when I when I first watched it for that forty five minutes, and then think I, f- I think I fell asleep. Or, I might have been ill actually. I might have just passed out on on paracetamol or ibuprofen or something. Uh, but basically, the last thing I remember from it is when Benicio del Toro. You kind of like okay, he he's kind of shady, but he he's probably the good guy here in a way or whatever. Right at that point in the film, and then suddenly, now I don't know if I'm misremembering this because. Okay. I, I kind of hope I am. I'm pretty sure he kind of like starts forcing his 
cock into that that prisoner's mouth or something like that, or, or like he kind of. No, he doesn't. He doesn't, he doesn't force it in his mouth. You know what he does? He like pretty much puts his dick in his face, like disrespecting him. Yeah, like you're going to say something like oh, "dick in your face." Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. I, I think I think he does that right, uh, uh, yeah. or at least yeah. So so basically, he's going to torch the fuck out of this guy, basically. Yes. And then at that point, I was like, "What the fuck just happened?" <laughs> Like that really, that really, uh, I'm not an easily shocked person, but that, at that point I was like, what the fuck? And, and, and then that kind of like, and then clearly I just passed out. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, I, maybe I fainted. I don't know. But, uh, and, and then the second time I was watching it, I was like, cause I knew that was going to happen. I was like, okay, this isn't all it seems basically, but, but I should go back. I was trying to rewatch it, but it's not on anything. It's not on Netflix or Amazon Prime or anything. I was like, I'm not going to fucking rent this basically. Cause I just, I've spent too much money recently. So, uh, but I do need to rewatch it. Definitely. Yes. Because like I said, this is one of the movies where when, once you watch it the first time, it's like you don't know where it's going. It's like, okay, the, half, the second half is great. But then when you watch it again the second time and you know what you know, it opens up in a way that's like, holy shit. It's like, it's like that's what... Denis Villeneuve is one of, them, one of the directors that even when you... even when you like, It's like with Prisoners and with Arrival. Like, even when you think that he's... Like, like something's pointless, like he does not waste space like even though the movies are slow like you find out later on you go back to watch them like blade runner i watched it again recently like he like he he cares about each he does not like to waste scenes even though you think he's wasting a scene like it's a it's, it's the scenes there for a purpose so when you watch sicario again it's like holy shit and then you and you start seeing it from the Toro's perspective he's like he's a victim but at the same time this is what happened like like it's, it's the same thing with jeremy renner and the same thing with um chris, chris pine like they changed these men into monsters in a sense, in different ways, in different degrees in a sense. You know what I'm saying? Like, Jeremy Renner's probably like the most, the most vir- the, the virtuous out of all of them, but he's still a monster because he, he does kill a guy at the end. He lost that kind of thing. And like, that's, that's the way that the world made him, be- that's the way the situation made him become or something like that, the environment he was around. The environment that Chris Pine was around turned him into that situation. And the environment that Del Toro's character was around turns him into that. It's going to be interesting to see what they do with Sicario too. If it was, if Sheridan wasn't writing it, then I would kind of be skeptical about it. But because he's writing it, I'm going to give it a shot. If, if he didn't write it, because I'm already like like sh- sh- shaky because Villeneuve's not directing it. But because he's writing it, I'll, I have faith that he's not going to bullshit his way. He's not. I don't think he's a guy that writes bullshit. So that's the main reason why I'm getting Sicario to a shot. I mean, I don't really have high hopes for it, if I'm honest. Um, so, but yeah, Sicario 2, uh, let's just see how it is to be honest. I think Sicario 1 is going to actually be on terrestrial TV soon because it's been practically three years. So so when it's on terrestrial TV, I bet they'll, they'll probably like show it right before Sicario 2 hits the cinemas. That's usually what they do in this country. So um, so it's not too long, a few months till that. Okay. Um, I mean, do you have any final thoughts on on the trilogy or Taylor Sheridan or anything like that? No, I just think he's a guy to watch out for, regardless of however Sicario Two turns out. Like I said, I like I said, I'll give it a shot because he's writing it. I'd much rather him do something original again, personally. But I I know the Sicario thing. We'll see what happens. You never know. But um, to me, like he's he has the potential to be great. Like he's he's very good right now. That's what I say. These movies are like together to get together. They're they're very good, maybe great, depending on how ten years from now it looks back. You, you never know what his body of work. It could be one of them things. But um, but yeah, I would recommend. Like I said, I would highly recommend anybody just like like just give them all three a shot within a like a, like a close proximity, and then see how you how you feel how you feel about him. But just know that there's gonna be a, it's gonna be slow going watching these movies. Just get ready for that. Yeah, the the last thing I'll say about because I haven't quite decided what I'm going to name this podcast. Like, it could be Wind River, it could be all three of the films, or it could be Wind River and Taylor Sheridan. I'm not sure. You know, because you, you can name it. You can name it uh, Taylor Sheridan and the Frontier Trilogy. Yeah, that's maybe what, that's what he calls it. That's what he calls it. Okay, um, but the only thing is we've barely talked about the other two really, except like sort of referencing them. Um, but any what what he's doing next is uh, it's called Yellowstone. So it's it's um, a, a TV series. And I think it's premiering uh, in on June the twentieth, twenty eighteen. So it's not too long from now. And I think he's writing and directing and producing. No, he's created it, written it, and directed it. It's starring Kevin Costner, Wes Bentley, Kelly Riley, Luke Grimes, um, Gil Birmingham is in it as well. So, so I'm just going to quickly read the premise because you know we have talked about him a lot, and then then we're out. So Yellowstone follows the Dutton family led by John Dutton, who controls the largest contiguous ranch in the United States, under constant attack by 
those it borders, land developers, an Indian reservation, and America's first national park. It's an, in- it's an intense study of a violent world far from media scrutiny where land grabs make developers billions and politicians are bought and sold by the world's largest oil and lumber corporations. Where drinking water poisoned by fracking wells and unsolved murders are not news, they are the consequence of living in the new frontier. It is the best and worst of America seen through the eyes of the family that represents both. Okay, so basically, I mean, that that really does like touch upon various things that we've talked about in this trilogy already so you can kind of see but this is going to be him directing it in a tv format so maybe you know like you were saying before that might be a good shout for him in terms of like you know considering his kind of directing chops and stuff um i I think from what i've heard the rumors about it i think it's gonna be pretty big to be honest so um so it's definitely one to look out for and uh, so yeah it's called yellowstone okay i think we're pretty much done so um don't forget to catch us on Facebook at Transatlantic Rebels Podcast and on Twitter at T underscore Rebels. So it's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from Rashad. Peace. Peace.